My guest today is Professor Gisela Kaplan, who is an emeritus professor in animal behavior at the University of New England, Harvey New South Wales, Australia. Her main research interests are in complex cognition and communication, both in birds and primates. Welcome, Gisela. Welcome, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So um, you have a number of very interesting uh, papers here. I found them really fascinating. And I want to start with one of your older papers from 2011. Pointing gesture in a bird, merely instrumental or a cognitively complex behavior, you ask. Uh, so you see in this paper, gestures, particularly pointing, are regarded as important pre-speech acts. Intentional and referential pointing has been shown previously in humans and apes, but not in songbirds. Although some avian species uh, show cognitive abilities rivaling those of apes, and their brain structures and functions show putative preconditions for referential gesture, uh, gesture signaling. You say mirror neurons, links of vocal learning nuclei to discrete brain areas active during limb and body movement. So this is this is really fascinating, um, Gisela. The, so when we think about birds, we don't think about them this way, right? So 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 what do you find in this paper? How do, how do I? Yeah, so the, the, so the, the pre-speech type acts that gestures and pointing and so on. So when I think about birds, I can't quite picture how they would point. So they're pointing with beaks, ah. are they? Well, actually, that had to be um, explained in detail because, as you rightly say, birds uh, pointing seems uh, uh, ridiculous because for pointing you do need um, arms or hands, or that's how it was thought to be. Well, what we did or what I did in the experiment was to enable the bird to sit on perches that were angled in in a way that they could face a half hidden uh, predator, a bird of prey, and one they particularly feared and would exclude from their territory once they knew that was there. So. Uh, the purchase meant in a in an angler face that they could uh, look towards the uh, a bird of prey and in whatever angle the purchase were, were they just imitating the first bird or were they all angling towards the bird of prey? So that's already one question where people would say, well, you know, if it just looks forward, it may just be an intense emotional response. Uh, but if they're all angled in a different way on their perch and they all look towards that point where the bird of prey sits then or, or stands, then that's clearly directed towards that bird of prey, not just intensely looking forward, because I could do that with their uh, just moving their head. The other uh, thing is they need to in order to point, they need to have their entire body in a particular posture so that it's clear that they are pointing in one direction. But of course, the very act of pointing is something that goes into theory of mind and was not thought to be possible for for birds at all. Mm. And that is that you do an act in order for the other to understand it has to change its behavior or understand something, mm. not just mimic me or said, what are you on about uh, and mimic me because you're the boss, but uh, you want me to change my behavior in accordance with where you're pointing. And once that other bird has understood why I'm doing this, then I sound the alarm as well. So mm. the interesting part was that they looked, then the next bird flew in and also looked, adopted the posture appropriate to the angle to where the bird of prey was, and then started alarm calling as well. Mm -hmm. And the final proof was that the last bird that arrived within that family didn't alarm call. 
because it didn't have to inform anybody else. The so it was the end of the lake. So it was achieved and then all the birds started uh, preparing for an attack. And magpies are not afraid like many of the corvida. They, uh, uh, they are the police in the bush and they will uh, try to get that predator out of the bush. So they are of great use to many other birds as well. But that had never been uh, reported because, as you rightly said in the beginning, it's a, a free speech act or has been considered to be a bridge. Gesture has been considered a bridge to speech in, in human species and in great apes. So, yeah, so the, the body posture, as you say, is quite important here, right? So um, it's the birds have their eyes on both sides of their, their head, unlike exactly. us. Exactly. And so it, it's really difficult. Well, I don't know if it's difficult, but it is different to to really say where they're looking, right? Well, uh, that's an interesting point. I'm glad you raised that. Yes, uh, birds have laterally placed eyes. So if they point their beak at the bird of prey that's about eight meters away, they can't actually see that bird clearly. Yeah. They can only see it either by turning their head to the uh, left or to the right and uh, by inspecting it with one eye at a time. So the focal point or sharpness in front of the beak is only a couple of meters and that's suitable for um, a feeding, but certainly uh, won't reveal the predator if they do that. So again, you know, they're doing an act that doesn't make that object clearer to them but makes it clear where it is so it's a locational thing so they obviously have to have seen it first by inspecting it uh, either with the left or the right mm. and, then, and, and, and as you mentioned sort of a societal communication aspects here the first one arriving doing something the second one reinforcing it yes and third one or determining that the information is already readily available yeah he doesn't have to do it. So it, it is more of a societal thing, isn't it? It's not just one bird doing it. Exactly. It's a, it's a commune. It's a genuine communication, and it's a communication that says we have a problem here, and that problem sits over there, and we need to address it. And it doesn't happen very often because uh, birds of prey tend to sit in exposed positions. You see, because they are on the top of the pecking order. They don't need to hide, <laughs> actually. So uh, it's rare that a bird of prey will sit under a bush or be half occluded uh, to the visual field. But the bird of prey was sitting there because it had caught something and it didn't want to be interrupted by another bird of prey. So that was the reason. And uh, so we emulated that situation simply by taking a um, um, a bird, now I've forgotten the name. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, not just a bird of prey, but it was a um, uh, an eagle, a white-tailed eagle. It's the largest eagle in Australia, and uh, uh, took a um, um, prepared uh, copy of it in there. So it. You know, it looked like a wedge-tailed eagle that was alive, but it wasn't. So it would stay there in the experiment. And um, we uh, uh, we then watched wh what was happening. And I suppose the reason why they had to do the pointing behavior is because it could easily be overlooked. It was mm -hmm. camouflaged well enough. So in order to warn everybody, it wasn't just necessary to give the eagle alarm call, and there I'm referring to another paper I did, which uh, which you might not have seen, uh, to show that uh, magpies have Australian magpies have referential signals, mm. meaning they have designated signals for with specific meaning. I mean the beginning of semantics, and the eagle alarm call is very specific, and uh, I recognise it anywhere. So if I hear the eagle alarm call given by them. I go in the direction where that eagle alarm call is given. So, um, but uh, the uh, uh, in this case it wasn't enough because the other said, "Where is it? You know, where is it?" So the pointing was the additional act 
that made it clear where the bird was. And that was a real risk to be that close to the ground because birds of prey um, are usually in the air and they can spot them with uh, one eye. But uh, when they feed on the ground, you see, so uh, having an eagle on the ground close by is not a, a great comfort to them. So there you are. Yeah, so, so you say here in the paper, evidence presented here indicates that the act of pointing may well be a complex cognitive behavior, an intentional and referential signal showing that pointing is not limited to having hands and arms. And so it is really part of the language uh, that they have, isn't it? It is. It is uh, a means of communication which extends in uh, primates also to, and in humans, also to eye gaze. Eye gaze is a very important uh, part and f partly functions as, uh, as pointing does in this case. For instance, the stare in a chimpanzee a juvenile when it wants some food or in an orangutan. We studied orangutans quite uh, intensively. They really stare the bit of food out of the parents' hands. <laughs> so mm -hmm. very intense staring. So that's very similar to a pointing gesture by a baby when it wants an item and it reaches out uh, and sometimes also vocalizes with a little cry of sound that I want this item. So that is the cognitive dimension. It's not just uh, something spontaneous. I'm, I'm hungry or I'm angry or I'm frustrated. I want something very specific and I want you to understand that I want it. And uh, that demands far more of, of the brain uh, than uh, simply copying something. Mm. And that's where the cognitive development is so important. And it's extreme. It's actually parallel to to human behavior in terms of language development and in terms of gestural development. Yeah, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later in, in one of the papers. So this idea that humans are somehow special <laughs> because we have large brains. Um, it really has to be questioned, right? So it doesn't appear that you need a very large brain to uh, to have cognition, to even have mind, perhaps. I mean, that is still an experimental question. Uh, so I want to go into another paper. So you say here, a, a recent paper, play behavior not tool using relates to brain mass in, in a sample of birds. So play behavior and tool using in birds, two well delineated and simply research, or sorry, amply researched behaviors have generally been associated with cognitive abilities. In the study, these behaviors were shown to be related to relative brain mass in a sample of Australian native birds, despite suggestive research results so far between cognition and tool using, this study found no significant difference in relative grade mass or in lifespan between tool using birds and non tool users. This is counterintuitive for me, uh, Gisela. You know, the, from a purely engineering perspective, I would have thought that uh, tool making, tool using are very, very complex, complex behaviors. Uh, but then you're finding here. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it is complex potentially, but there are other behaviors that are equally complex that seem to correlate with brain size, right? Yes, well, you know, brain size is, of course, a very gross sort of measure. And uh, you raised the point before uh, implicitly, but when you look at a bird, of course, that head is very small. It's, it's tiny and compared to a human or compared to an elephant. Well, you know, what can a bird possibly do? And the assumption was, no, there can't be much in that brain uh, because it's so tiny. But then we have invented computers. We have in invented chips. We have invented uh, and changed in the last decades. Just uh, I remember my first computer. Uh, I was so proud. I had a backup disk of two megabytes. <laughs> it was a huge, big disk in 1990, a huge disk, and it got two megabytes on there. Well, now I have a memory stick that has uh, three terabytes on it. Right. So the idea of memory 
as needing a large space is now very outdated. We know that uh, you don't need a large space to create space for memory. It depends how and what mechanisms what mechanisms there are and what storage capacity there is. So first of all, it's not just the brain size. Obviously, birds lose out every time uh, because they're, they're aerodynamically designed. But it's how much of it is for brain, where there is the uh, center for thinking and how much there is in neural density. And once we had the capacity to actually check what, how many neurons there were in the brain, which we can now uh, do, it was uh, to our surprise found that uh, birds like ravens and uh, cockatoos have a neural density, <clears throat> forgive me, uh, about the same as uh, great apes. Now, that was a great surprise. So, and then that's not the end of the story. You need the connections and what fires up is connected with what. And of course, uh, any cognitive process needs to somehow store the memory. And birds have sections of neurons which never renew and they stay, they form a permanent uh, memory. That's a very important part so that uh, the storage of memory can also be very extensive. And birds are actually very brilliant. They're, they're the Mozarts of, um, of, the, uh, of the animal world because uh, when they hear a sound, you've probably heard of mirror neurons, um, uh, Jill, yes. the uh, capacity by listening to have absorbed and memorized what has been given and then you can actually repeat it yourself without having the original there anymore. Mm. So uh, Mozart managed to write down the whole concert the next day. Birds can do the same, absolutely the same. So memory plays a huge role and there is this additional uh, feature in the brain of mirror neurons, which in, in vocal communication may help to explain why they can retain sequences for a long period of time and have en enormous memories. Yeah, I never thought about this this way, uh, Gisela. So it is not the size, it is really the structure and sort of storage and retrieval software, let's call it. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. That, that, that really matter, right? So so yep. this, this idea that bigger brains and, you know, we came up with this metric brain size to body mass or whatever, you know, uh, yeah, that's... things are really relevant in, in, in this context, right? Well, they're not irrelevant, yeah. but if you base all your conclusions on it, you're bound to be wrong. And uh, while, a brain, while the brain of a bird looks very different, you have to look at the function and what relates to what. And there are more similarities between a bird brain and a human brain than we ever thought. Because, uh, you know, the, the human brain has got all these curves and folds the bird brain is completely clean and clear, and I thought, well, no, uh, no, uh, none of these structures are there. So how possibly can the bird think? But the bird can think, and that's been shown now in so many things. It goes to facial rec recognition of humans. It goes to complex uh, processes of problem solving, and uh, here. I want to say something important. You know, intelligence isn't is partly a given thing, but partly a a, a point of usage. Yeah. Use it or lose it. So <laughs> or, it's a it's a hardware. <laughs> There's a and hardware, there's an operating system, and there's all the applications you put on top of it. So yes. if you're just sitting there with no applications. Even exactly. though you may have a supercomputer, it's not yes. really that useful. <laughs> no, uh, that's exactly right. And it's very important to remember that. So this paper that you mentioned on play behavior yeah. is very important in that respect because play behavior develops in juveniles and they play with each other. And let's say in, uh, in magpies and uh, a songbird belonging to the corvida, 
as well as in uh, cockatoos, a typically Australian uh, species that doesn't occur anywhere else. Uh, it's just that Australasian uh, region. The uh, uh, ability to play. Now, let me go one back further and say yes. that parents in Australian birds care for their offspring for a much longer period of time than anywhere else in the world. Mm. So uh, that accepts, uh, with the exception of uh, macaws in uh, to have a dwarf in origin anyway. But uh, that aside, the length of care by parents means that they offspring are protected. They are juveniles that are under parental care, and they may be so for two years. Mm. And in that time, they can actually develop peacefully without being constantly afraid or stressed by the dangers of the world around them. And they have other juveniles around them. And if they have, as they have other juveniles around them, they develop play behavior. And the play behavior was always, uh, has a number of function attributed to it. But uh, one that I discovered now is that we, you know, the correlation, of course, doesn't mean cause and effect, but it does mean those that play a lot actually have larger brains. Yeah, I mean, it makes a it makes a lot of intuitive <laughs> sense. I mean, uh, playing requires a lot of skills. I mean, you need to play with somebody else. There's sort of uncertainty. You have to be able to sort of predict what the other individuals are going to do <laughs> in some sense. So there's a lot of thinking going on in, in social play, I would imagine, right? Well, and I'm glad you mentioned social play because uh, usually we categorize play as solo play, um, object, and play. and uh, the least number of uh, species of worldwide other than humans engage in social play. So that's considered the highest form of play. And you are absolutely right. You have to think, A, you have to agree that this is make-believe. So if you attack the other, no harm will actually come to you. When it begins to be painful, the other party will voluntarily stop so that you can actually enjoy the game. But as you know from uh, human play, sort of, let's say hide and seek, you go boo, and a child for that moment is actually frightened and sometimes screams. So what happens is that uh, the responses for fear responses or stress responses go peak, actually peak. But because it's identified as play, that stress hormone, corticosterone in the case of birds, goes down very quickly. And managing stress is a huge survival a skill and aid. And is likely to lead to a longer life if you can do that, you see, because if you stray, stay stressed, you don't make good decisions. So we know that play in that moment has a beneficial effect on the individual in terms of its responses to stress. It reduces stress and it increases pleasure. But what it also does because of that, it stimulates the brain. So brain growth is probably maximized if you play. Doesn't mean that, you know, it causes the, the brain size, but it put, fulfills the potential to maximize that. And it actually also helps survival and long life because uh, the, in that period, you've learned how to deal with stress. Yes, I want to touch on this, uh, the, the thing that you mentioned, uh, Gisela. So uh, Australian birds, you said the parents actually protect the, the children longer. So they have a safer environment to grow in, a safer environment to play in, so to speak, and, and develop, um, develop further. Um, I just I take a quick tangent, uh, Gisela. So, it has implications for humans too. Um, I mean, you know, we are struggling in the US, for example, with many policy choices where 
uh, kids don't have a safe environment. They cannot develop. They cannot play. <laughs> you know, and it all adds up to the uh, to, to later outcomes uh, for these kids, right? So, uh, the the broader theme I think here is that all animals, including humans, have this requirement to to actually experiment in a safe environment early on for them to, to really develop. If that environment doesn't exist, then you are a different different individual uh, when you grow up. Oh, you, you are. And in fact, uh, and that's not just in terms of growth patterns, but it's in terms of the uh, development uh, of the hormonal presence in the brain, you know, dopamine. Um, uh, for instance, is a good feel good uh, in kind of hormone or serotonin or so. But uh, they have been shown to in in deprived children or in drug addicts to reduce in size the dopamine centers. And uh, there are certain things, and then the individuals end up depressed and asocial, and and a whole host of consequences are there. Uh, so yes, play is very important, and social play meant face to face, doesn't mean sitting on a computer game. <laughs> yeah. uh, for the while, you may get technical certain technical skills, and uh, a reaction time, but you. You are getting poorer in reading faces, and you will be poorer in empathy. In fact, you may totally lack that dimension because it's all virtual, and you have no actual proof that the other side is responding in an adverse or uh, a good way, and you can't read their responses, and you you have no insight in what their feelings mean. So these... Um, theory of mind. If you understand what the other things you uh, can think, then you also can't have empathy with the other. So it, you know, goes about both ways. So play behavior in in birds. To come back to that paper, was shown clearly to in social play to have led to the largest brains that we know in birds. Yeah. And there is a clear relationship. And tool you, as you mentioned, you see, we're, as a species, we are very proud of ourselves, always, you know, very supreme. <laughs> and uh, uh, we consider tool use as one, it, it, humans the tool users. And that was always considered unique to humans. And there are many qualities that were considered unique to humans, which turned out to be incorrect, because in evolution, things do happen gradually. And um, but uh, I, as far as I remember, the human brain did not enlarge after they started using tools. So, uh, you know, of course, it doesn't say whether the neural density didn't increase or the connectivity didn't increase, but the brain didn't the size didn't increase after that. So we have attributed something to tool use, which might be a byproduct of many other things and part of that is how the individual can be treated in development you see there's something unique about birds versus mammals 95 percent of birds in in the world form a partnership with one partner it's male and female mum and dad looking after their kids mm. and uh, in mammals it's only 5% of species, including humans. We are one of 5%. So you have marmosets and uh, various other species where uh, male and female take per a parental role and uh, protect their offspring. The others may be in groups of aunties and, uh, and, and many others. The uh, female has to raise the offspring by, by herself. So there's a very different model. Yeah, that's really fascinating, Gisela. So is our understanding today, uh, I haven't really uh, read more about this, but there was a hypothesis that birds are the remaining dinosaurs. Is that is that the current hypothesis or no? Well, that may well be so. Uh, that's, 
it's usually believed that to be so, but there are alternative theories and uh, I'm not a paleontologist, uh, so I wouldn't know much about that, but uh, I'm happy to say that all modern birds evolved uh, in East Gondwana, what is um, now a modern Australia. So listen carefully. <laughs> all the birds you see and songbirds you see in the world are of chain and origin. And that happened because 65 or 66 million years ago, we had this uh, catastrophic event which ex uh, led to the extermination of the dinosaur and 75% of all other species. And uh, the only birds that survived were in East Gondwana. Mm. So there were two, 22 lineages left and they developed from there. So I suspect what happened when they radiated out via Asia eventually uh, to uh, uh, Europe and eventually only three to four million years ago to the America, to North America, uh, they lost many of the attributes that they had in the beginning. So the time to caring, for instance, for your offspring got shorter, not because um, because circumstances prescribed it, like uh, uh, stronger changes in summer and winter, and they had to get out and they simply had to raise them and push them out of the nest and make sure they go. And uh, the amount of migration that happens, happens in, in climates, of course, with clearly defined winters and summers, which you don't have in um, most of India, you don't have in most of uh, Southeast Asia, and you don't have in Australia, even though Australia has a lot of temperate climates, but uh, certainly not these dramatic changes. Yeah, but the reason I ask is uh, if the family structure that we see in birds, as you say, you know, um, mom and dad looking after the kids, are not generally seen in mammals, uh, except for humans and some other, a few other things then it sort of implies that mammals are quite different from birds, aren't they? Oh, yes. And uh, it's always been celebrated as um, the rise of mammals since 60, uh, 65 million years ago. And it is because it's a development of, um, of anything, you know, from uh, from uh, horses to apes to, uh, and, that, and that's remarkable and the great apes have many things in common and we are on the same evolutionary line as great apes. So they were, it's of great interest. Birds have always been watched and been of interest to bird watchers because of their color, because they can sing, because of their music. But um, to put them back into the evolutionary scene and in terms of intelligence, that there is a complete, I mean, they, they are 300 million years of difference between human and, and bird evolution. And to see that there are certain parallels, important parallels or mm. convergent evolution, as we call it, uh, it suggests that in the package of possibilities, there are also constraints. There are only certain ways living organisms can develop, you know. And um, I think it's important to remember that, that all other organisms can also develop in a trajectory that leads to very similar outcomes as in humans. And I think crucial in this bird development, and especially because I can follow this here in Australia from, from the point of view of evolution, uh, that I state that the model of parenthood has been a strong survival aid. So it has remained, and this has remained in most of the world. Many other things have fallen apart. Um, Certainly the length of time of supervision has fallen apart. Cooperative breeding is strongest in Australia, but not so strong, has almost been lost in, in the rest of the world for the bird mm. world. But <clears throat> cooperative breeding, um, meaning several generations looking after them, plus mum and dad, then uh, you have an environment in which learning can take place at a slower pace and maturation can occur. You see, the in some songbirds, as the zebra finch has been studied very well, yep. when they fledge and they get out, some of the neural connections haven't even formed. And there are very much risk for three to four weeks in terms of survival because they can't respond. The, the connections aren't there. 
And uh, if that development is covered by parental control, then that can fully develop. So obviously your chances of survival increase. Mm. And by the way, you know, in, in we have two parts of the brain, of course, and in humans it's the corpus callosum, which links both of them. And in humans it takes well into the 20s before it's fully developed. So if our teenage children do very stupid things, it's because mm. the message from one side to the brain takes sometimes two to three days to end up on the other side of the brain in w where it can be tempered and modified. So if you see teenagers doing very aggressive things, and I wasn't thinking clearly, it's because we have two sides of the brain that do different things. One is the emotional side, the other one tempers and keeps back the emotional side. So if, if the news doesn't travel very fast yeah. in teenage years, it doesn't because it's not fully formed then uh, the, the body doesn't regulate it and you need outside parents who said, hang on, <laughs> don't jump off this building or, you know, don't, uh, whatever. Uh, then uh, protection obviously helps a calm maturation and it helps avoid um, injury or death. So it is a very good principle. So the irony is that humans and particularly cockatoos are the most altricial, and I'll explain that in a minute, species that we know, meaning the most underdeveloped, uh, pathetic little creatures when they come to Earth. When naked, um, birds are even blind, you can't hear very well, and you're totally, totally helpless. And that goes for humans and that goes for cockatoos. You have a cockatoo in your hand, you have a tiny little blob in your hand, and it's totally dependent on the parent. The advantage is outside the body, it doesn't uh, drain the nutrients of uh, the parents, so they can provide the food outside. And if they are there to protect you, they can develop much further than is possible, let's say, inside an egg um, and uh, in, in other ways when you get fully furred individuals out. So the possibilities for further development are increased, but only if you have the safeguards of parents who are both clever enough to get enough food for nutrients to keep their chicks alive. Yeah, I'm fascinated with this idea. Like I said, if I understand this, humans are more bird-like compared to other mammals or most other mammals in many respects. Is it because we, when we set off, let's say 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 years ago, we observed birds and learned from them? I mean, I mean, why are the humans different? Why are humans different from- From other mammals respect? who don't seem to have this type of an organizational structure like birds do? The organizational structure, well, we live in pairs. We live in social groups. So that's very similar. And uh, whether they have anything to do with each other, but as I said, you know, in nature, the, the package of opportunities in which direction uh, organisms can develop may have its own constraints. So, you know, you don't get uh, individuals with seven heads. The maximum is one. And there are certain basic principles where I think um, uh, we can pare them down to that even on very different lines of evolution, you get um, uh, very similar outcomes. Mm. But uh, I think the importance here is we arose from the primate line, but there were sufficient pressures on on humans. And uh, don't forget the hominids. There were some 13 species of hominids. Right. We are the last ones left. So not everything in evolution of humans is successful. It's usually suppressed that most of most of our line died out because they were not sufficiently viable. And somehow we jumped we jumped the gun uh, and we are the survivors. And if there is a difference, uh, an enormous difference between humans, it is to have developed written language. Because if you take Joe Blow in the street, I doubt very much if every Joe Blow in the street is brilliant as some total of human achievements. 
but we can all look it up. Yeah. And uh, oral cultures can only rely on oral cultures. And we now have found that birds also have cultures, but they tend to be confined to one area and to one family. Uh, the same is in cetaceans like uh, dolphins and whales and killer whales was shown that a technique of getting uh, seals off the coast, I think of Patagonia, uh, was invented by one female who's taught all her offspring so that entire pod knows how to do it, but it's not been invented anywhere else and it hasn't mm -hmm. traveled. We are very good in that communication and in writing it down. So it spreads to the whole world. But incidental knowledge can also spread amongst birds. I don't know whether you've ever heard that funny story of the blue tits in England. One of them decided that uh, flipping uh, the blue tops of uh, milk bottles was an important thing. I don't know whether they got any milk out of it or whether they simply liked the color. But uh, somebody plotted where this happened and it spread through all of England. Mm. So the bottle top uh, blue tit uh, thieves um, then occurred through England. So that's possible too. So culture can travel and can probably travel better in birds than in any other species because they can fly. They can, yeah, they can fly. Perhaps there is a bird Google that we are not really aware of yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the bird Google is uh, migration, and I am very worried about uh, current concepts, some current concepts of conservation that call every species that occurs that hasn't been there before as invasive. Now, if you take that at absurdum, you'd have to say all the birds would have had to stay in Australia and every bird that ever migrated out to Southeast Asia or uh, Southeast, uh, East Asia and uh, onto Europe is invasive and should have been killed uh, because it's invasive. So the amount of travel and speciation has been part of the process of evolution and it, it becomes sort of a funny double bind because we have populations that are locally almost extinct and they flourish somewhere else. And somewhere else they are seen as a pest and uh, eradicated. So we have a very strange sense of uh, evolution being something static. This is the here and now and this is how it's got to be and that's uh, how it has to stay. It's always been dynamic. The yeah. same we assume of the brain uh, that it's uh, uh, static. No, it's totally dynamic. You know, you had, uh, I remember you had Leslie Rogers uh, on one of your podcasts. She showed for the first time that an external event can even change the brain function. And that was just input on light on a certain day. And they were, they came out when they hatched, they came out lateralized or non lateralized. And that changed their entire life history. Just that fact. So we, we as organisms, and that goes for every living organism, respond strongly to the environment, be that light, be that sound, be that uh, temperature. Temperature is now very, very important because some um, species like crocodiles and uh, turtles, eggs are hatching in different uh, uh, sex according to temperature over 32 or under 32. And um, so if we don't get this right in terms of climate change, we could lose species worldwide in a, in a jiffy because they can't reproduce uh, or they only produce males. But um, the, the idea of flexibility is uh, one of the greatest achievements for all living organisms. And in birds, in particular songbirds and in parrots, it's, uh, as in humans, it's interesting that they are lifelong learners amongst them. Yeah. That means you can learn until you're 70 or 80, and that goes for a cockatoo. Yeah. I've got a cockatoo that's in his best men's years. He's 50 now. <laughs> he still learns new words. <laughs> still going, yeah. So initial conditions matter a lot, and this is not well appreciated. Um, in, in all species, initial conditions matter a lot. 
So, so I want to touch on one other uh, paper that you have, recent paper, long-term attachments and complex cognition in birds and humans are linked to, you say, pre-reproductive pro-sociality and cooperation, uh, constructing a hypothesis. So you say human pro-sociality has often been regarded as an important step towards the capacity for empathy, to think of others in compassionate and caring ways. This ability in turn is related to social attachment. Many writers have rightly argued that in order to understand the biology and evolution of social attachment, a comparative approach across many taxa is needed. So pro-sociality has been studied extensively in humans, non-human primates and, other, uh, and some other mammals, but studies examining developmental stages and pro-sociality in social birds are um, relatively sparse, you say, for rather recent date, and an articulate understudied area in avian behavior and biology. So again, you know, think about uh, birds, we don't think about it this way, right? So because we haven't spent enough, enough time studying them, I guess, so, but, but it's all there, you say, very similar yes. to that. Well, so again, uh, your comparisons, uh, uh, pro-sociality is now a very important um, subject in uh, in psychology in humans, and that concerns age groups of 13 to 16 in particular, but it can extend either way by a couple of years. So it's a development of a pro-social attitude towards others, being interested in others for their own sake, and uh, being kind to others without needing some reward for it. So, you know, it's not favor doing and you owe me some. So <laughs> it's a very different level and it's a level of friendship. And the interesting part in this is that in a human behavior and um, assortative mating, it's called, you, you tend to marry somebody, good marriages are those which are, where male and female are very similar in their family backgrounds, in their beliefs, and uh, and so forth. And it has been shown to make a huge difference uh, in success of marriage. And uh, most of those go back to a knowledge. Some of them have grown in similar environments, in similar towns, and if we know of childhood sweethearts where they marry each other later, but they may have been in primary school together or in secondary school, or they may have been neighbors and always played together outside. And uh, the same we discovered in birds. And this is very recent. This is, very, this is only four years old or so, mm. that it was found that they form bonds well before sexual maturity. And this is a hugely important discovery because it was always thought that there was a trigger sexual maturity and they go off and sort of like a robot need to sort of do this and it's genetically driven and so forth. It's not true at all. Birds make uh, choices and so do, uh, it's been shown in great apes. There was this case in a Chicago Zoo where the male was provided with a new female and the old female was taken away because she didn't produce any offspring. They wanted a breeding program and he would never once mate with her, never once. And they tried everything and that created a new way of thinking. Why would that be? Mm -hmm. So obviously it's not that blind need to copulate. There's something else at play here. And it turns out that it really is personality likes and dislikes that are powerful in determining whether the the partners will get on and they when they choose that they uh, very often bond well before sexual maturity and the sexual maturity sort of flows into that you know it's not uh, something that needs to happen immediately something that grows naturally and then they stay together for life so they're monogamous species that, as far as we know, are monogamous, like uh, the cockatoos. They don't produce more than three, four offspring usually in a lifetime. And they look after them very well. Their survival rate of the offspring is very high. 
and they stay together for as many as 60 years. Now, how many humans can say that these days? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating, uh, Gisela. So pre reproductive bonding and yeah. post sociality, you say here, you know, I was thinking as you were talking, it's a bit of a slippery slope here. So uh, in some South Asian cultures, you know, um, uh, kids are sort of set set up very early <laughs> to be married and in certain aspects you know as you know there is you know the signs to arrange marriages and so on and so forth uh, and i wondered if they, you know there is there is a there's a slippery slope there isn't it i mean uh, and, yeah go ahead i mean i don't i wouldn't have liked to have my marriage arranged to tell you quite uh, uh Clearly, because my views of my parents were sharply discrepant, so I would never have trusted my parents to find a partner for me that was appropriate for me. <laughs> However, it, there is plenty of evidence. If the parents get on well with the child and they grow up in a certain environment, intellectual and social, and have good friendship patterns, and there is another person of that similar environment, they have already got enormous gains, 80% of their social lives, they've already shared. And having shared that gives something to build on. Mm -hmm. uh, while, you know, these days it's good luck. Uh, many uh, partners are uh, thrown together. Some of them work, some of them don't. But certainly divorce rates are very high. And if you look at sometimes the discrepancies, that are so great, nobody has quite worked out why some of the marriages fail and why more and more fail. But there may be an aspect of early childhood or pro-social development to see, let's say, an assorted mating or, or uh, marriage in human terms uh, as a uh, give and take. They have learned, you know, we have the regenerations They've learned everything I want, I I need, I want, <clears throat> I must have. Uh, it's very different to what do you want, what do you need, what, uh, what can I help you with and share. So that demands a form of a social brain which develops only in those teenage juvenile years and improves tremendously if those age groups play with each other face to face. So uh, let's say abusive um, uh, social media comments would not be possible. <coughs> Excuse me. The reason why they're possible is because the writer doesn't know that the words have effects because you need to be opposite that person and that person needs to be able to tell you immediately. And that changes behavior so that you can adjust to, to that need of the other or learn that the other even has needs. Yeah, so let me take a bit of a tangent, uh, Gisela. I, I don't know much about this. So in the modern world of high mobility, we have 8 billion people around the world. Uh, if the pre-reproductive bonding and pro-sociality are quite important for success, that sort of narrows mate selection to fairly constrained local positions, uh, if I understand it correctly. Uh, is that is that optimum? I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, sort of 8 billion people, you know, sort of sloshing around the world. <laughs> and, and how do we how do we think about that? Well, I don't think uh, it's uh, very localized, but if you look around the world, of course, uh, many people are stationary and remain very stationary throughout their lives. I mean, you and I live in countries that are very mobile and have populations of people from all parts of the world, really. And uh, intermarriages here of different cultures are very, very common. Uh, and in fact, so common, so there's no common background. They're different, even language background, different backgrounds. And they somehow work. So obviously that narrow process seems to be, well, perhaps not quite as uh, correct or 
or perhaps we mark them as um, our flexibility. And uh, birds have that flexibility as well. We we can, uh, you can breed cockatoos, uh, self-aggressive cockatoos with galahs. Now there's a substantial size and color difference and I still have successful offspring. So uh, it's not a, a, a strict firm rule. What one thing that does we know works is this kind of uh, shared experience and particularly either having had a very similar background or having developed a high degree of pro-social behavior or both together. Uh, so you can't get around to pro-social behavior. Uh, that uh, is seems to be really important. So if both parties, let's say one comes from China and the other one that comes from South America, have both had childhoods where pro-social behavior could develop, they probably have no problems whatsoever. Yeah. Can pro-social behavior be electronic? Uh, I I doubt that very much. There are only one or two studies to that effect. And we are gravely influenced here by the attractiveness of the technology, which seems to make scientists, even who have found negative results, negative outcomes for the technology use and gaming and so forth, labor to find something positive because they like the technology themselves. So <laughs> we are in a kind of we're in a kind of double bind. But it uh, seems to me that uh, the uh, contact is to learn to read other faces and moods. And if we stop doing that, if if the other stops becoming important other than as a visual image, which I can, I can replace you by another visual image, you see. You can be there and gone. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a person opposite me, they're irreplaceable. So you have to learn the value and respect for an individual as well, which is um, somehow not easily possible. So yes, there have been studies that show negative outcomes, other studies wedded to the industry or the technology or have grown up in that way that say otherwise say so we're nowhere with this at all yeah. but we are certainly developing in different ways than we had uh, before and the sense of community is more and more problematic if you have virtual communities that you can switch out right yeah we need more data oh. so so i want to finish up with your uh, i think this is a review paper gisela so uh, of great apes and magpies, initiation. Now that's a, yeah, that that paper was not a review paper. I okay. was asked how I got into animal studies. Yeah. And uh, so the review paper was more, what was the other paper I sent you? Um, one on prosocial behavior and another one. The on, babbling, uh, babbling in a uh, babbling, uh, the development of uh, of speech and of vocal. Uh, learning that also depends on parents, which, by the way, is very similar between humans and <laughs> Australian magpies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Identical, in fact, the stages yeah. are identical. It's yeah. So, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, so I found this really interesting. So you you talk about sort of animal encounters here, right? And um, how do these animal encounters change humans? You know, in some ways. It changes uh, animal animal too. So, so, so what are you talking about in this paper? I mean, there are a lot of uh, case studies here. I found some of them really emotional. Um, you don't expect certain behaviors from from animals in this fashion. Uh, and it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of memory and brain size and uh, intellect and uh, analytics and so on and so forth. Um, but we find a lot of surprises here, right, in this in this encounters. Yes, and uh, these encounters uh, I've been privy to. That was in the uh, Primatological Society. We had an international conference, and uh, the conference organizer set aside a round uh, table discussion on the topic: Did we ever have uh, an epiphany? And 
unusual event with an animal that determined what we were doing in future or how we were thinking in future. And that discussion went on for hours. And most people had such experiences and, of course, have never dared uh, telling anybody about it because uh, that's the anti, uh, anti-science. anti If you want to be blown out of uh, the science court tomorrow, it is to admit that you suddenly love and understand an animal. You know, it's, just, it, it's not a scientific basis, but uh, the uh, epiphany is for the special event that happened where the animal reaches out in some way that we understand, but we didn't expect the animal to be capable of doing. Mm. So, uh, and that changes minds. For instance, that uh, guy who worked in bio um, chemistry and uh, wanted to find um, drugs to um, cure AIDS, he injected um, chimpanzees every single day or every single week with horrible drugs and made them suffer and they got AIDS and and they died miserable deaths. So he had a dreadful job on his hand, but one of those chimpanzees, when he was ill and was away for several weeks, took his arm and just brushed it slightly like a well-wishing and I'm sorry kind of uh, gesture. And of course, that's very similar between apes and um, and humans. So the guy went away and he could not give another needle from that day on. And he actually rescued them. He's dead now, so I can talk about this. But he rescued all of them, meaning he stole them from the research institute and uh, put them into a sanctuary and uh, uh, mended his way, so to speak, and was for their survival rather than you could no longer use them in these experiments. So that was one of the epiphanies. And one for me, for birds, uh, for uh, even orangutans, I worked in primatology and ornithology, is that an orangutan juvenile adopted me as its new mother in in the jungles of Borneo. And I, I've always grown up in cities, you know, I've no sentimental views of animals. In fact, they didn't even play a major role in my thinking of no experience I, i've never even seen a horse until i was 12 years old would you believe and uh and not a live cow either because a uh, city 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 person and uh it was heard of a bird in the distance but that's it and then you get a juvenile orangutan clamoring up on you well this is this is a bit of something and i didn't know what to do with it there was nothing in my past that could tell me how I should respond, what would be a, a nice response, so I just let it happen. And uh, it was an overwhelming experience. And I learned in that contact, A, that I had actually subcutaneously, subliminally, in every which way, opinions about animals without knowing any. and. I was surprised that orangutans smell beautifully. They smell like orange peel. Mm. And I I was surprised about that. Now, why was I surprised? Surely, I knew nothing about orangutans, uh, how gentle they were. The skin on an arm of an orangutan looks exactly like ours. There's no mm. difference. I found that almost problematic, you know, uh, as yeah. a, uh, uh, wow. <laughs> and uh, its behavior and its signals were that of a child. And it, it stroked my head ever so slightly, a very gentle, lovely gesture. And the species was speaking back to me when I hadn't expected it to be able to speak back to me or to even show signs of such emotional tenderness. Um, and that certainly was a changing uh, mm. experience. And then the other experience with a magpie, that's why I've studied Australian magpies. I owe this to one magpie. Just came up and it was flying in the garden. It wasn't in captivity. They said to me, I've got dinner for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got dinner for you. What? And I uh, wasn't sure whether uh, it was the bird, so I followed it and it said it again to me. 
And I thought, the bird can say a complete phrase that's meaningful, it's the right time of day. Where did that come from? Hmm. And of course, you know, then I was off. I had to find out where it, how it learned it, why it learned it, uh, why it was coming back at me, what mimicry meant, whether mimicry was just mimicry or moved into the cognitive, which I then found. I found a link to the cognitive thing as very much as uh, Irene Pepperberg did with Alex. But I had to find it in the wild. You know, Alex, the parrot, you may have heard the African a great parrot. Um, she did some language studies with it. And um, I learned the names of um, of dogs. And it was living on a farm and a cat wanted it to disappear. And instead of the magpie moving and flying away, it called the dog by name and the dog <laughs> came running and chased the cat away. So you see, that's the shift to cognitively complex behavior because it's no longer mimicry. It's applied correctly to a new situation, has meaning, function, and an outcome. In this case, a very clever outcome. Yeah, the go to the bodyguard, so to speak. Yeah, yeah <laughs> as, it's employed the dog as its bodyguard. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, it worked. That's on one quick thing, uh, Gisela. So, yes. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but I spent some time in the pharmaceutical industry. And and you mentioned this, you know, there are a lot of animal studies that go on very early uh, before human trials. You know, typically mice and dogs. It used to be chimps. I don't know what the status quo is. And scientifically, we find very little uh, information in animal studies that correlate with human uh, efficacy. And so it is a process that we've been following for 100 years and we continue to do so because regulators think that it's a process that everybody should follow. I think these things uh, need to be questioned, right? Um, unless there is you know, sufficient utility for these cosmetic things that researchers do, uh, it has a lot of painful side effects that are not really taken into account. Well, uh, you're quite right. I mean, you know, I don't like animal experimentation and that, and I know why it has happened. Uh, there are certain things where animals are alike to humans, and in marmosets, it happens to be the eyes are very similar to humans. So many eye research uh, projects have, in fact, used marmoset eyes. And um, so that's one aspect. But uh, you're quite right also in pointing out that the genetic uh, aspect of similarity is a very useless argument <clears throat> to base such massive decisions on. We've, we've overestimated uh, genes for a long time and the environmental influences are just coming back in again. And I'll give you one example for that. Uh, it's always been in all studies confirmed that uh, something like 98 or 97 percent of orangutan or chimpanzee DNA is the same as humans. And the, the assumption underneath is that the similarities are because we're in the same trajectory of evolution. Then they did the uh, mouse genome study. And you know what the uh, number of uh, identical genes are between humans and mice? It's very high. 99 percent. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely more like mice than. Uh, yes. So than chimps, the, yeah. the problem is that they and you know even bananas we share sixty percent of the same DNA with uh, with bananas. So uh, I ask you, you know, what do we base? Uh, this can't be a justification for just about anything. But, um, for anything. But uh, certain parts and reactions can, and um, but there are so many alternative ways. I have the same trouble at the moment in in bird research um, with uh, telemetry. You know, people are keen to put these massive packs on backs of animals. Well, they suffer as a result, and um, some of them will even die. But uh, we are so wedded to technology that we don't see that, and the same. Of course, we need testing, but in the good old days, uh, the uh, uh, 
interested doctors in progress, they always tested uh, substances on themselves. If you recall, they didn't take animals and they said they're too far, too far removed from us and we won't know all their reactions. So, you know, I give a cautious but optimistic answer that in future we might uh, develop or rely less and less on animal models. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Gisela. Thanks so much for spending time with me. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was interesting the way you developed it too. Thank you. I was trying to look for a word for taxonomy uh, 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 and I was trying to look for another word uh, for taxidermic studies because I thought some people may not understand what that is. Uh, if you want to insert the word in taxidermic because we use taxidermic eagles. They were the exact replica of the eagles with real feathers and real heads and so forth. Right, so, right. you know, they're more uh, prepared by people who would have the gift of the gab to do that. But anyway, that was it. Right. I hope yes. this turned out. Do you think that made any sense? I tried to make it simple. Yes, I'll put this together and send you the details once, uh, once it's... Oh, OK. That's nice. That's nice. Thanks again. <laughs> That's very nice. Uh, Thank you. Very uh, nice and intelligent interview. You don't know what I have to put up with sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, again. So that was enjoyable. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. So what is it now? What time is it now? You are.